Glenn Greenwald is the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who in 2013 broke the Snowden slash NSA spying story, is a co-founder of The Intercept, and also lives full-time in Brazil. I recently got a chance to talk to him about Brazil's presidential election and the ascendance of Jair Bolsonaro. I should mention, he also runs an animal shelter, so if you hear some dogs barking in the background, that's why. Here's our conversation. I'm here with Glenn Greenwald. Uh, Glenn, thanks so much for being here. I'm happy to do it. Thanks for asking me. Um, so we have a lot to talk about, so I'll, I'll try and be quick with some of these questions. Um, I wanted first or mainly to talk about the uh, election in Brazil. Most people know that there was an election recently, and um, maybe some people have heard in the news uh, in the U.S. that uh, Bolsonaro is being called like the Trump of Brazil. You've pushed back on that. Um, before we go into the broader context here, could you talk a little bit about who the next president of Brazil is? What are his policies? What sorts of things can we expect from his administration? Sure. So I've never really thought the comparison to Trump was particularly helpful. In fact, I think it's fairly misleading because the newly elected president of Brazil, Jair Bolsonaro, is much more extreme than Trump in almost every respect. Additionally, Brazil, because it's a much younger and more fragile democracy than the U.S., is much more susceptible to extremist authoritarianism. Even if there are things Trump wanted to do, there's things he'd be very limited in doing, whereas that's not the case for Brazil. So both in terms of ideology and capability, I think Bolsonaro is much more extreme than Trump. And I guess the best way that I would explain Bolsonaro is that uh, Brazil was a military dictatorship from 1964 when the elected government was overthrown in a military coup engineered by the U.S. and the U.K. with Brazilian generals until 1985. So for 21 years, it was ruled by a very brutal uh, military regime that tortured dissidents, summarily executed journalists and the like. And Bolsonaro was in the military during that time. He wasn't a senior official because he was young, but he was a captain in the military, and ever since Brazil came out of dictatorship and began democracy in 1989, his philosophy has been more or less the same, which is that Brazil was much better off under military rule, that the flaw of the military regime was that it only tortured people and didn't kill enough of them. He said things like, only a civil war can resolve Brazil's problems in which 30,000 people are killed. If innocents die, that's fine because innocents die in war. He said the first thing he would do upon being elected president, he said this about 10 years ago, was close Congress. And then even right before the vote that elected him, he promised a cleansing of the kind Brazil has never before seen in its history instead of his leftist opposition that either they have to submit to his rule or be imprisoned or forced out of the country. So just kind of continually, there's a series of ideologies and statements, there's racist and misogynistic and homophobic ones, far more extreme than anything Trump has said. And the political culture and institution in Brazil makes it much more likely that he'll be able to do a lot of those things than, for example, Trump would be able to do. Okay, so I, I wanna get into um, why uh, Bolsonaro was able to win um, because his victory is definitely a, a shock, at least to people in the U.S. Um, one of the, the caveats that's worth mentioning is um, the former president Lula, who polls had indicated would have beaten Bolsonaro in a head up, like a head-to-head -head race. Um, what was Lula's orientation politically? Why was he not allowed to run? So Lula was president of the country from 2002 to 2010. He was kind of began his political career as a hardcore leftist leader, a union leader, but became much more moderate in order to become elected in 2002. So by the time he became president, he was more of a kind of, I don't want to say centrist type, but kind of within the mainstream of, say, the Democratic Party. Um, he implemented social programs that helped the poor, but at the same time, was definitely a capitalist, um, hedge funds and banks and oligarchs thrived under his presidency. And when he left office, when he was term limited out of office in 2010, he was probably the most popular leader in the democratic world. He had something like an 86% approval rating, 
to the point where he handpicked his successor, Dilma Rousseff, who became the first female president of the country. And she served for one term, was then reelected. In the middle of her second term, Brazil had this kind of convergence of crises. It had an economic crisis, a uh, public security or violence crisis, and a corruption scandal that ended up getting blamed on her. And she was impeached from office um, in 2016 under pretty dubious uh, conditions and was replaced by this kind of center-right government. So Lula's party, the Workers' Party, was really, I would call, a center-left party that for a long time was really popular, but then became unpopular. Um, more recently, he was still leading the polls um, throughout 2018. Um, most polls showed that he was likely to win. Whether that was just because people remembered him so fondly or because his name recognition was so high or because people really longed for the restoration of a Lula presidency is something we'll never know because the courts in Brazil, also under very dubious circumstances, rushed to convict him of a very minor corruption case, um, which then rendered him ineligible to run for office. So he was barred from running, even though he was the poll leader. Um, and that ultimately paved the way for Bolsonaro to win because he didn't have to run against Lula. Um, so when you say dubious circumstances, uh, w was there any merit at all to these corruption charges? Um, were there other politicians who had committed similar or worse crimes as he was accused and who did not receive the same level of punishment? So Brazil itself is a fundamentally corrupt country. It's hard for a Westerner to understand because when you live in the U.S. or Western Europe and you talk about political corruption, it's usually isolated cases. You know, this politician took a bribe or this politician engaged in insider trading. Brazil has a systematically corrupt political process and has been that way for decades. So when you, if you were to ask me, is Lula himself corrupt in some theoretical or broad sense, I would have a hard time answering that. I don't know the answer to that. It very well could be the case. There are actual significant political leaders as well as oligarchs, billionaires who went to prison as part of this corruption probe. The case that, so Lula faces multiple corruption charges. The case that he was ultimately convicted on though was always considered the most trivial and the least serious. The allegation was that he had received uh, renovations on a triplex apartment in exchange for doing favors for one of the country's major construction companies. And the reason they chose to prosecute him for that case was because it was the simplest case. So they could prosecute it really quickly in time to bar him for the election. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say the charges were so dubious was because there was zero evidence that Lula was even the owner of the apartment, then the, the deed of the apartment was never even transferred to his name. It wasn't a very nice triplex apartment and Lula has become quite rich just from the, the speaker circuit that has enriched people like Bill Clinton and um, Tony Blair and Barack Obama. Sure. Um, he could have easily bought that triplex apartment a zillion times over. Um, so the only evidence that they used to convict him on was the word of somebody who was already in prison and was being uh, offered a more lenient sentence in exchange for accusing Lula of having committed these crimes. So the evidence was very sketchy to non-existent. Um, and the, the speed with which the convictions were carried out very clearly had political incentives designed to bar him from the election. So when I say that the conviction is dubious, I do not mean that Lula is free of corruption um, or anything of that sort. What I mean is just looking at it as a lawyer and a journalist, um, the case itself has very, very weak and sketchy components to it, both in terms of the process and the evidence. Okay. Um, so one of the major fears of a Bolsonaro presidency was the threat of violence, um, particularly towards marginalized groups and political opponents. Um, but even before he had gotten elected, um, a friend of yours, Mariela Franco, had been assassinated. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that and what, if any, progress has been made in that investigation? Sure. So uh, Mariela Franco was an amazing political story because Brazil is a country where political power and economic power are wielded overwhelmingly by 
white men who come from rich backgrounds. As most people probably know, Brazil has very like, extreme levels of income and wealth inequality. And Marielle, in contrast to the standard politician, was a black woman. Um, she was openly gay. She came from one of the worst, most violent and deprived favelas or slums of Rio de Janeiro. Um, she was a single mother by the time she was 19, and yet she overcame all of that. And she went and got her master's degree um, in sociology and then went to work for a left wing state representative um, who investigated organized crime in Rio de Janeiro and therefore became a target of death threats and to this day has very extensive security to protect his life. Marielle worked for him for about a decade, became a very well-known human rights advocate and then ran for city council in 2016 and not only won, but was elected with a huge vote that shocked the entire city. Um, my husband, who's in the same political party as her and also comes from a favela and is black, was elected at the same time as she and sat next to her in the city council chamber. And so she became this very inspiring and important figure because she kind of was a vessel of hope and inspiration to huge portions of the population in Rio de Janeiro and Brazil more broadly, who generally were accustomed to not having hope and not having a political voice. She's very, she's very charismatic, and very brave and very defiant in the way she stood up to powerful political factions. She was unbelievably fearless. And so it wasn't just her story, but it was just kind of the force of her personality and her singular charisma that made her such an important political presence. And in March uh, of 2018, March 14, 2018, she had left an event um, that was about black women changing the political power structure in Brazil, was riding in her car being driven by her driver when uh, four bullets were pumped into her skull, nine bullets entered her car by extremely professional assassins. It also uh, killed her driver. Um, and it's very clear, given the extreme competence with which this assassination was carried out, that very powerful factions were behind it, almost definitely parts of the police and the military. And to this date, eight and a half months later, there's not been a single arrest. Um, there's really no leads about who pulled the trigger or who ordered this very sophisticated crime carried out. Um, and increasingly, there is a kind of hopelessness that we'll ever really find out who was responsible for her her murder. Um, moving on from from that, I just wanted, as as someone, uh, as I guess a, a young person, one of the things that kind of confused me, I wanted to ask you about, was how is it that young people were apparently some of Bolsonaro's most ardent supporters? Was it just the appeal of him as an anti-establishment or so-called populist? Or what what was going on there? Yeah, I think you put your finger on a big part of it, um, because traditionally, you know, the kind of stereotype of young political activists is that they're attracted to the left. Obviously, in the 60s and the 70s, the way that young people expressed their anti-authoritarianism was by joining left-wing movements, protesting the Vietnam War, denouncing the Catholic Church, kind of the institutions of authority. And there is now this reversal, not just in Brazil, but throughout Western Europe and in the U.S. as well where these kind of far right or alt right extremist right movements are being increasingly supported not by old people but by young people and there's a real question about why that is there's a book um called kill all normies it's very controversial by angela nagel who's a, an irish leftist in which she spent a full year digging into the alt right online culture and found that it was kind of the new way of being transgressive that kind of the cultural left has become dominant and tells you what you can and can't say, like the Catholic Church used to tell you what you can and can't say. So if you're a young person looking to be defiant and to break rules and to feel rebellious, instead of going to the left, you now go to the right. Because the right is who tells you, oh, we're going to let you break the rules and we're going to let you be naughty and we're going to let you be bad and we're going to let you be rebellious. And I actually had some personal insight into this because about nine months ago, Bolsonaro went onto Twitter and used his Twitter account to use a phrase that is an epithet in Portuguese for gay people, 
um, called Burning the Donut, which is intended to evoke imagery of anal sex. Right. Um, and he used it against me to basically to call me a faggot, but did right. it in a very kind of crude way by putting it into Google Translate. It didn't really translate well, so it was kind of stupid. But that was the appeal of it, right? Was that it was like anti-intellectual. It was kind of dumb. All of the major Brazilian media outlets, including ones who dislike me, you know, scolded him and said how terrible it is to attack somebody for their sexual orientation. And yet for weeks, I was inundated with internet users who were followers of Bolsonaro, you know, from like 18 to 25 or 26 or whatever, who were just having the most fun time imaginable, sending me every conceivable different type of, you know, gif or picture they could find of a donut burning. And I didn't, you know, I didn't really feel like it was being done with a kind of malice or hatred or anger. It was more being done by this kind, with this kind of spirit of mischief, you know, we're told that we're not allowed to say these things. And so we're laughing mm. as we say them. And I absolutely think that's a big part of the appeal of Bolsonaro, just like of Trump and Brexit and extremist parties in Europe when it comes to young people, which is that they increasingly view the political establishment as repressive and corrupt and um, kind of tyrannical. And so anybody who stands on the outside of it and promises to defy its orthodoxies becomes attractive for the reasons that anti-establishmentarianism has always been attractive to people who are young. Mm. Um, you mentioned earlier the economic crisis in Brazil. Um, Bolsonaro has an economic advisor, Paulo Guedes. Um, he's a U Chicago educated economist. Could you talk a little bit about him in particular and the reaction of global financial markets to this election in general? So I think Paul Geddes is, is one of the most important parts of the Bolsonaro presidency and also probably one of the shrewdest things that he did. Um, for a long time, Bolsonaro was actually looked at as kind of this freakish fringe figure by the plutocratic class in Brazil that actually still does wield a lot of power. He was never one of them. They never looked at him as somebody that they wanted in power. And he essentially said in the middle of the campaign, probably about seven or eight months ago, look, I don't know anything about economic policy. I'm not really interested in economic policy. I'm an army captain. I care about you know family values. I care about public security. So I'm going to just turn my economic policy over to Paulo Geddes, who is kind of the wet dream of the oligarchical class. He's one of these classic so-called Chicago boys who privatized everything under Pinochet in Chile, who has this extreme free market ideology, who wants to get his hands on all of the state resources of Brazil, including the Amazon, and sell it off to the highest bidder. Um, it's almost certain to lead to huge amounts of graft in the process. That kind of privatization always does. He also wants to cut social programs, um, you know, essentially just serve the agenda of the wealthiest at the expense of the poor. And once Bolsonaro signaled, not just to the Brazilian oligarchical class, but to international capital, that Paulo Geddes would be running his economic policy Every time a new poll came out that showed Bolsonaro's lead increasing, the Brazilian real and the Brazilian stock market strengthened. Um, and you just saw this kind of increasing confidence on the part of economic elites that Bolsonaro's presidency, which they once regarded with a fair amount of horror, um, would actually be quite, quite beneficial for their agenda. Uh, could you speak a little bit about what um, what is happening with the Amazon? Because that's also a, a major carbon sink and any uh, deforestation or devastation of that area would obviously have a big impact on the planet. Yeah, I mean, Brazil has long been one of the most important um, countries in the in the world for um, for maintaining any kind of hope of combating cataclysmic climate change because of the Amazon's importance um, to the atmosphere of the earth and to the carbon dioxide and oxygen that are produced. And Brazil under both Lula and Dilma, though certainly not perfectly, um, 
was, was at least a, a, a world leader in terms of trying to oppose full-scale deforestation, of trying to solve the country's economic problems by selling off its natural resources. The Amazon and the vast swaths of land in Brazil that are undeveloped um, probably is now the single most important part of the planet, if not the most important part, um, in terms of uh, averting catastrophic climate disaster. And what Bolsonaro intends to do when it comes to the Amazon and environmental protections is so terrible from the perspective of environmentalism that I, I literally couldn't overstate the case, in part because of the influence of Paulo Geddes, but because, also because there's a very strong and powerful rural um, faction within Brazil that consolidated behind Bolsonaro's presidency early. They oppose everything like naturalizing land, um, pro environmental protections, uh, restrictions on the ability to deforest and um, turn natural resources over to the logging and mining industry. And so on that front, probably more than any other, although it's not as kind of um, flashy and glamorous to talk about when compared to say authoritarianism or killing journalists or dissidents or whatever might actually be the most damaging aspect of Bolsonaro's presidency. Um, so I know we're running out of time here, so I'll just, I, I have one last question, um, just following up from there. It seems like Bolsonaro and a lot of other, um, far right politicians, uh, do kind of just what you're saying, that they have this sort of anti-establishment language, but that in many ways their policies are going to benefit a lot of these entrenched, powerful forces. Um, and I think that that dissonance is like really frustrating to a lot of people, and it's frustrating that people can't see it. Um, could you tell us why you think people like Bolsonaro succeed in spite of that? Or is, is there a lesson here about what we can do to fight back against that? Well, I think that, you know, when a ruling class betrays the interest of a large portion of the population for a long enough period of time, sooner or later, they're going to come to realize that. Maybe you can fool them for a few years. Maybe you can fool them for a couple of decades. But at some point, they're going to start to realize that the deprivation and misery in their lives and the failure of any hope for a better life for their children are attributable to the decisions and actions on the part of the ruling class that has been essentially pillaging their own lives for their own benefit. And anybody who stands outside of that ruling class and depicts themselves successfully as an enemy of it is going to be somebody who's going to be more appealing than the status quo. I think you see a lot of that in, for example, Britain, where if you talk to British voters who voted for Brexit, a lot of them were well aware of all of the arguments about why withdrawing from the EU would be contrary to their interests. It's not like they were ignorant of those arguments or had been kept from them. It's not even that they didn't believe them. It's just that they had concluded that the status quo left them with so little hope that rolling the dice on something unknown was worth it because they had so little to lose. And I think that's a lot of what happened with the victory of, of Bolsonaro is that so many people in Brazil, tens of millions of people who fear that when they send their child to school, they're not going to come back because they're going to get hit by a bullet in a shootout between the police and the drug gangs or can't have health care or any decent education because the political class from all parties have been stealing the nation's wealth. They just they have nothing to lose, that even if Bolsonaro sells off some national interests um, and works for the wealthiest, their situation can't get any worse, and maybe it'll get kind of better. And either way, as human beings, we're not purely rational actors. We're also emotional actors. And when we have anger and resentment and bitterness toward a group of people who we blame with validity or not, for our plight, we want to see them suffer. We want to inflict injury on them. And so when that group of people is saying, you're not allowed to vote for this candidate, this candidate is bad, this candidate is wrong. If you vote for this person, you're a racist or you're primitive, you're a troglodyte. When the people who are saying those things are so hated, it almost becomes more of an incentive to want to do it precisely to inflict 
suffering and unhappiness and vengeance and misery on the people that you blame for being the authors of your woes. And I think we're seeing that not only in Brazil, but throughout democracies. On that note, Glenn, thank you very much for joining me. Sure. It was great to be with you um, and uh, good luck with uh, whatever you're doing. All right. Thanks so much. Okay. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. All right, folks, that was my talk with Glenn Greenwald. Thanks for listening to Dunk Tank. See you next time.